Good evening once again. Good to see everybody this week. Appreciate the goodness of the Lord for another week and bringing us together. And I appreciate each one of you that have come out this way and our Facebook audience as well. And um, appreciate this church. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Appreciate you. And of course, we're thankful for the building, but I'm talking about you. Yes, and uh, I'm talking about the love that you have for the Lord and for his word. And I'm um, just thinking on that this week and just thanking the Lord that we've got this place together that we can come and meet around his word week by week and uh, edify one another. And uh, you ought not take that for granted because, you know, there's a lot of a lot of folks in a lot of areas that they believe the same way that we believe. And they believe in the same Savior, the same part of the same body, Amen. but they don't have a local fellowship that uh, takes a stand on sound doctrine and the word of God rightly divided and that can be a lonely thing uh, that people have to deal with in those situations and I'm grateful for the internet and the opportunity to, to reach them in their homes and I'm thankful for the, um, the communication and the feedback I've had from some that have benefited from the ministry here as well and so don't think that what we're doing here is in vain uh, certainly the Lord takes note of it and there's people that you don't necessarily see sitting here with us that appreciate it as well. So I just wanted to encourage you in the Lord to stay by the word, stay faithful to the Lord. And uh, we'll just continue to grow and encourage one another as we move ahead. Amen. 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 Matthew chapter four or five tonight, rather. We're in Matthew chapter five at this point. And uh, wrapped up chapter four last week. And of course been going through uh, really uh, most of the, the opening chapter here of Matthew as we're studying the larger study Israel my glory and uh, just trying to get some foundational things laid down as we're entering the gospel period and uh, going to put some things in place that I think will enable us to uh, begin moving through this a little bit faster here in the weeks to come and uh, see some things developing but want to make sure that we've got a good foundation to comprehend uh, the gospel period and this uh, fourth installment of the fifth course of punishment on our timeline and so just kind of taking our time with these opening chapters of Matthew here and uh, coming to a very important portion of scripture here starting in Matthew chapter 5 and really the section runs from chapters 5, 6, and 7 it all goes together and uh, the next three chapters here in Matthew's gospel we're going to be presented with what is most commonly referred to as the Sermon on the Mount mm -hmm. right the Sermon on the Mount and this is a sermon that is preached by the Lord Jesus Christ himself, you'll see that Jesus is uh, speaking uh, for the majority of these chapters. Uh, if you have a red letter edition Bible, you'll notice that everything from chapter 5 to chapter 7 is in red except for the first two verses of chapter 5 and the last two verses of chapter 7. All right, so the Lord is doing a lot of the, the, the talking here. He's, he's preaching a sermon, in essence, to the people that are gathered around him here. And so this is a sermon of the Lord, and he is uh, preaching that up on a mountain, right? That's why you would call it the Sermon on the Mount. Preaching a sermon on the mountain, verse 1 is clear to point that out to us, where he's located, and uh, the people that are in attendance as he's uh, speaking these things in Israel. And uh, the location of where this is taking place is not without significance uh, as it relates to the fact that it is on a mountain, in view of the fact of what the Lord himself is going to be dealing with here in this chapter, and we'll have reason to talk about that a little bit. And there's really a lot of fascinating things that the Lord addresses uh, his disciples in when it comes to this Sermon on the Mount. And uh, again, it's a three-chapter section, rather lengthy, and so a lot of things are dealt with in the Lord's doctrine. And he does deal with a lot of fascinating things as the sermon progresses through the chapters. Uh, but in the larger section of what we're dealing with, this Sermon on the Mount is the fifth of five prophetic issues that Matthew is presenting in relation to the commencement of the Lord's public preaching and teaching ministry. We've seen some prophetic fulfillments already with uh, the, the beginning of his ministry. Started off with the fulfillment concerning the location of where his light would begin to shine in the land. In connection with the prophecy from Isaiah chapter 9. We have seen the Lord himself begin to actually come into Israel preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Um, and, and declaring the message that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he was anointed of the Spirit of God to preach the gospel, as the prophet said, and he fulfills that. We have seen that he has also begun to call out a special class of children unto himself that are going to have a ministry with him in Israel. And um, they're going to do the signs and the wonders. This is a group that's going to be known as the Twelve Apostles. 
And we've seen the beginnings of their callings here in chapter 4, most recently. And then at the end last time, briefly, we saw that Jesus begins to perform the signs of the kingdom. And doing that in confirmation of the message that he's preaching. Right? He's preaching the message the kingdom is at hand. And that's borne witness to through the signs that were promised. And the, the blessings of the kingdom that he's uh, showing forth by the, uh, the exercise of his power in his ministry here. And so all those things are... Uh, prophetic issues concerning Christ's early ministry that the prophets taught Israel to look at. And we've seen fulfillment in uh, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ that gets underway. This fifth one's no different. It's part of a prophetic issue that concerns his ministry, and it's actually one of the biggest issues that he's going to talk about here. Uh, the largest section of verses and one of the most significant things when it comes to kind of understanding what the ministry of the Lord in Israel is going to be all about. And I think you'll see that as we move along. And so to get underway with this tonight, I want to just read here the first, op uh, the first two verses, the opening verse of chapter 5, just to get underway with this. And we're going to talk a little bit about what's going to be taking place in this sermon, what the Lord's looking to accomplish and the objectives of it. And we're also going to do um, a little bit of looking into the, the prophets and set a little bit of foundation for why this sermon that the Lord preaches was so necessary at this time and uh, why he's talking about the things that we can read about here in chapters 5 to 7 of Matthew. And so, if you got your place in Matthew 5, look at verses 1 and 2. The scripture says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying... And then he goes on from there, and he preaches his sermon. I want you to notice, first of all, that... What's taking place here occurs as Jesus sees the multitudes. The multitudes undoubtedly are those that were referenced back in the previous chapter there at the end of verse 25. He's been preaching the gospel of the kingdom in Israel and he's, begin to, he's beginning to perform the signs, right? Healing all manner of disease and sickness, casting out devils. And the fame of the Lord has spread abroad throughout the region. And it talks about how that there in verse 25, that there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and Decapolis and Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. Right? It's been noised abroad that there is a man who's performing these great miracles and has a ministry that has begun. And the multitudes begin to flock to the Lord Jesus Christ. They've heard him preach. They've seen his power. And they're beginning to follow him. And Jesus looks up and he sees those multitudes. He sees people that have come and, and heard and, and partaken of the ministry that he's had thus far and, and seen his signs and heard his preaching and from all quarters they're gathering to him. And when he sees those multitudes, the Bible says that he went up into a mountain, goes up into the hill country as it were. And when he was set, the Bible says that his disciples came to him, right? his followers, if you will. There's some disciples now that have been called out. And as those disciples gather around him with the multitudes, but the disciples in particular that come to him, he does what it was described there in verse number two, and he opens his mouth and he taught them these sayings that come in the chapters following. You see that the, the primary emphasis here, while no doubt there's a, a large mass of people from all quarters, you've got believers and believer, uh, believers and unbelievers mixed in there. The, the primary emphasis of what it's talking about here, especially at the beginning of his sermon, it, it wants you to see that his disciples are coming to him, and it's his disciples that Jesus is beginning to teach some things. He's preached a gospel concerning the kingdom, right? Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And there's been some that have begun to follow him, have been separated out from that larger population of Israel, and they're flocking to him, and he's going up into a mountain now with those that have presumably believed the gospel of the kingdom and the signs that he's shown, and he's now going to take those that have begun to follow him, and he's going to start teaching them some things. He's going to start laying some doctrine down in their souls concerning this kingdom that he's been preaching about and that he's been showing the signs of. And he opens his mouth and he teaches them saying, Matthew says. Now, the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom is what has been going on, uh, going on at this point. Again, he's begun to assemble a believing remnant of his disciples at this point. The separation has started. 
by the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom, the, the separation right between wheat and chaff that John the Baptist had talked about, the true from the false, it's begun with that preaching. But now the Lord is going to start teaching some doctrine to his disciples to start forcing that separation and that division to be even, even further than what's just taken place by the preaching of the gospel. Now, this is not the end of the separation. As the time moves on, you're going to see that divide between the true and the false get more and more. But what the Lord's doing here in this sermon is he's just he's pushing that axe head on through there a little bit further so that the divide starts to get a little bit wider and wider here at the beginning. And he does that through some corrective doctrine that he's going to be presenting to his disciples here in his teaching. Now, more or less, the Sermon on the Mount is going to set forth the fundamental constitution of kingdom righteousness. Amen. All right, this is going to be the, essentially the, the, the foundational basis of righteousness that is going to characterize the kingdom when it's established. He's been preaching the kingdoms at hand. Mm -hmm. The time is short. The kingdom's coming. It's right around the corner. Supposedly his disciples had believed that message. And so now Jesus is ready to teach those that believe that the kingdom is at hand and that it's coming. What are the tenets of that kingdom? How is that constitution going to be put together for that kingdom? What does righteousness look like in the kingdom of God? He's going to teach them those things in this sermon. Now, that, that issue of this being the constitution of kingdom righteousness, that's one reason why I think that this sermon is taught to his disciples up in a mountain. I alluded to the fact earlier that that location is not without significance. Uh, you'll remember, I trust, that in the past when we've been coming through this and talking about matters of the kingdom, we've talked about that symbology of mountains in the scripture. Right? You go back to the prophets and you'll find that, that uh, mountains are symbolic of kingdoms. Right. Hmm. Isaiah chapter 2. It's a good passage to look at in connection with that. It talks about uh, the mountain of the Lord's house being established in the top of the mountains. Right? His kingdom is going to be exalted to reign above all. And you see that imagery throughout the scripture. And here when Jesus is ready to lay down the tenets and the constitution of the kingdom that he's been proclaiming, it's not without significance that he's gone up into a mountain. He's set there and the king is decreeing the commands of righteousness concerning that kingdom. And he's doing that with his disciples that have... Come unto him and want to be a part of that kingdom. And so this sermon is a kingdom sermon. It's based entirely upon kingdom doctrine to disciples who have believed the kingdom gospel. And that's an important thing to understand when it comes to understanding why the Lord says some things that he does. Mm -hmm. Why he talks about certain doctrine in the way that he does. It's founded back upon the the law and the prophets and all those things. And, and he's, he's teaching Israel about this kingdom. That's the program God has in effect. Yes. That's what they're looking for. That's what the hope is that's being preached at this time. And so it's kingdom doctrine being taught to disciples that believe the kingdom gospel. Hmm. Very important to keep that straight. Now, there's a number of things that the Lord accomplishes in this sermon. However, one of the primary issues... That I think made it so necessary for him to cover the information that he does in these chapters with his disciples in particular is the fact that false and corruptive doctrine in Israel's vain religious system was very pervasive in the minds and the hearts of the common people. You've got to understand the environment in which these disciples that have believed the gospel of the kingdom have come up in. What is it that they understand about God? What do they understand about the kingdom and the Christ, for that matter, and what he was coming to accomplish? What do they understand about righteousness and what that means to God? All of that's been influenced by a religious system that has been teaching and propagating what amounts to corruptive and false doctrine for quite a while through the period of silence up until the point where they're at now in the Gospels. There's a religious environment that has influenced the minds and the hearts and the thinking of the common people. But it's corrupt. Mm -hmm. And the Lord is going to have to confront the common teaching of the day, what they have been told and what they have been trained to think 
about God and righteousness and the kingdom and who he is as Christ, there's some things he's going to have to confront head on that exist in their thinking. Because if he doesn't, what that is effectually going to do is it's going to prevent them from operating as the children of their father that they have been called to be. It'll prevent it. They don't have the critical discernment to understand really what, what this kingdom is all about. What the righteousness of that kingdom is about because there's some other influences that's impacting their thinking. They're going to enter that kingdom and receive a reward in that kingdom. Their minds are going to have to be transformed to think about things completely different because what they have learned to date is not in line with what God's idea was and is for the righteousness that the kingdom promised and talked about. Israel's vain religious system had been propagated and was being propagated. The corruption of Israel's vain religious leaders had indoctrinated the nation and in that vain and corrupt religious system, the Lord is going to expose the fact that they have so manhandled and mangled the law of God with their traditions and their hypocrisy and their vanity to the point where the Lord will come along and say that by those things, they actually make the commandments of God of none effect in the people's minds. The way that they have mangled the law, the way they've covered it over with their traditions and really asserted their traditions and to be on par with and even in place of the laws and the commandments of God, the common people have received that. They've seen a form of righteousness that's been taught to them by the Pharisees and scribes and doctors of the law. And that, that tradition has such a grip in their thinking and in their mind that when they hear something that actually is the commandments of God, it doesn't impact and affect them the way that it's supposed to. It just kind of hits and falls off. It doesn't impact. It doesn't get down into the heart and to perform that effectual work that God intended for because they've made the commandments of God of none effect by their tradition. You see. The Lord knows that's what's going on in the minds of these disciples and the people in general. He knows where, where their, their hearts and minds have been trained to be and it's not where it needs to be as the program progresses on for them to enter the kingdom and to find a reward out there. That's going to have to radically be overhauled. Based on what they've been indoctrinated with. The corruption was so pervasive that it had even gotten to the point of distorting the people's conception of what the word of God taught concerning the kingdom. It had corrupted the way that the people thought about and conceived of the very doctrine of the Christ. What he would be like and what God had said that he would be like when he came. What he was going to be doing. Those types of things. The tradition had even gotten in there. The corruptive doctrine had gotten in there and mangled that doctrine. So the people really didn't even understand who and what to look for in Christ. And to ex what to expect concerning him. Totally had messed up the issue of righteousness. And what that was and what that meant to God and what the law said that was. It's totally making the commandments of God of none effect. And so it was absolutely necessary that the Lord confront that corrupted doctrine and the influence that it had upon the minds of his now disciples. He's going to have to strip the law of all that vanity. All that hypocrisy. He's going to have to challenge their thinking in order to get them in the right place so that they're thinking right about him and his work. And every other issue concerning the righteousness of God and that kingdom and the gospel that they believed. One quick example of that, if you have your place here in chapter 5, you cast your eyes down to verse 17. Notice something that the Lord says here. Matthew five seventeen. Jesus says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So the Lord is up there in the mountain. He's opening his mouth and he's teaching his disciples saying these things. And one of the things that he tells them here early on is think not this way. Think not that I'm come to destroy the law and the prophets. 
Now, why would the Lord say, think not this? Right? Well, probably because that's what they were thinking. Or at least that they would have had a, a tendency to think this. It either exists in their mind, or he knows that based upon what's going to happen, that they are, would have a, a proclivity to think this way. And he's coming along to challenge that and say, don't think that. Okay? Don't, don't think that I, who you receive as the Christ, that I am coming to destroy the law and the prophets. Now you'd have to ask yourself, based upon what we know of the scripture and what we've studied in the past already at this point, why in the world would any Israelite ever think that the Christ was going to destroy the law and the prophets? Had God ever said any such thing as that? Now, we're going to do that based upon anything God had said. Now, the reason that they thought that was because Israel's vain religious leaders had developed a system of religious traditions that they had superimposed not only to be on par with, but actually to take the precedence over what the law and the prophets taught. And in their method of teaching their tradition... And their outward righteousness. The way that they instructed the people and the way that they thought of their tradition is that, you know, when the Christ comes to establish the kingdom, what he's going to do is he's going to actually, he's going to do away with the law and the prophets and he's going to establish our system of righteousness as the standard of perfection. Our traditions, right? The traditions of the Pharisees. And those doctors of the law and so forth. They've got their traditions. They've got their, their doctrines about purifying and washing of hands. And all these other doctrines that they had come up with. About all these things in life. And they esteem that to take the place of the very commandments of God. Make these of none effect and establish our system of righteousness. And we're so pleasing to God that when Messiah comes, he's going to do away with all this. And he's going to teach you to do what we teach you to do in the tradition. That has an effect of, on the people of thinking, you know, that the Pharisees have an untouchable standard of righteousness, an exalted and lofty form of righteousness. That's what God's looking for when it comes to righteousness. And the Lord here is coming along to just drop an atomic bomb on that whole mindset and say, hey, think not that I'm coming to destroy the law and the prophets. I am not come to destroy. He said, I'm come to fulfill. Yes, sir. That's a dagger right in the heart and right in the mind of, of everything that they have ever heard. This is radically different than what they've been taught. They, they've never heard anything like this before. This is astonishing. How do I know that? Look at chapter 7, the very end, after he's finished these sayings and he's finished his sermon and he's gone through all these points of corrective doctrine, just confronting the vain religious system over and over and over again. Don't think this that they teach you. Don't think this that they teach you. Think this instead. Three chapters of it, you come down here to the end, verse 28, and it says, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority... And not as the scribes. Flies in the face of everything they've ever heard. This is, you know, what new doctrine is this? And it wasn't new doctrine. This had been talked about in the law and the prophets all along. This is what it told them to expect and prophesy. And we've seen it fulfilled over and over and over. But they don't know that because that's not what the religious system taught them. See, by their tradition and their vanities and, and that show of outward righteousness, they, they profess to know God. They honor him with their lips, but their hearts far from him. And that's what they've been indoctrinating the nation with over and over and over and over, year after year after year after year, to the point you get here to the Gospels. And the Lord Jesus Christ is coming along saying, hey, everything they told you is wrong. Everything they told you is wrong, and I'm here to tell you what the truth is. And he strips away all their hypocrisy, all their vanity, all their corrupt doctrine. He says, here's the truth. And it absolutely knocks the socks off these people. They're astonished at it. He teaches with authority. He doesn't teach as the scribes. 
He's not talking about the tradition of the elders. He's talking about one who's been taught of the Father. He knows the book frontwards and backwards. And he stands up and he opens the book and he talks about it like one with authority who knows what he's talking about. And he's able to explain it and, and, and put it where it goes and tell us exactly what it means and show us what the Word says. Amen. And it exposes the fact that those religious hypocrites have been lying to us all this time. But it, it blows their mind. It's challenging their thinking. Huh. He's essentially coming along and saying, everything they taught you, you need to think pretty much right the opposite. If you didn't know anything else, do right the opposite of everything they tell you, and you'll be pretty close to accurate. <laughs> it's essentially what, oh, the message that the Lord's bringing. And he goes through category after category of doctrine where he just exposes it. What they say, you've heard them say, but I say unto you this. They say this. But I say this, making the division, that two-edged sword piercing through the false doctrine, stripping it away so that the people can see it. They can have the discernment, and they're going to need that. Right? His disciples, as the timeline goes along, it's going to become more and more important that they have that critical discernment and be able to see that system for all the corruption and vanity that it is. Because there's going to come a time when those leaders are going to turn on you. They're going to cast you out of the synagogues and put you out. And I know the tendency is going to be to want to, to cozy up to that thing. He says, but you need to see it for what it is so that when that separation starts taking place, you don't resist it. You need to see that that whole entire system that they profess to be righteousness is actually devoted to destruction. There's nothing good in it. There's no light there. It's all darkness and vanity and sin. And it actually, it's aligned right in line with the adversary's policy. And if you want to be a part of my kingdom and enter in there and have reward in that kingdom, it's going to require a complete and total break from it. Because it's going to be destroyed. The Lord has to begin challenging these ideas that they have and this teaching that they have received from their Pharisees early on and begin to... Start widening that gap. It'll continue. The Sermon on the Mount's not the end of it. He'll continue to build upon these things. But this is, this is really the point in Matthew's gospel especially where these disciples that have come after him, he's going to start forcing that issue to, of separation a good bit here with the corrective doctrine. Teaching them to think differently. Think not that I'm coming to destroy the law and the prophets. I'm not come to destroy it, but to fulfill now, leave Matthew and come back with me now to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 29. I want to come back and look at some of the things that the prophets had said about this corrupt religious system that existed in Israel. And seeing this, hopefully we'll be able to see the abominableness of it and how that God despised it. And he spoke against it by the prophets and really prophesied issues that the Lord would have to come along and correct this and, and reprove them of it. And a lot that the, the prophets say about Israel's vain religious system, we're just going to look at a few passages here that illustrate it tonight. But here in uh, Isaiah 29, let's uh, look at... Verse 9, pick it up there. Isaiah 29, 9. He said, Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers and seers hath he covered. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. See, the prophet here is really denouncing their leadership. Talked about their prophets and rulers and seers that are covered back up there in verse 10. They're staggering around, but he says it's not with wine or strong drink. It's not that they're physically intoxicated. What they're drunken with is this, this false 
doctrine about what's going on in Israel at this time. The vision of all has become as a book that's sealed. They have no perception. They have no discernment. They can't see the truth. It's right in front of their face. They're just staggering around in a drunken stupor, drunken on false doctrine, right? They're not filled with the Spirit of God and the Word of God. They're drunken with a false teaching and a false doctrine and a false truth. And they can't understand. It's like the book sealed. Can't read it. I can open it up and look at it, but I don't understand it. The book's sealed. Vision of all is like that. He delivers the book. They say, read this. I'm not learned. I, I, he doesn't understand it. No understanding they have among these vain religious leaders. And he says in verse number 13, basically the reason for that is because this is all just a religious show. No discernment about them. He says, wherefore the Lord said, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me and their fear toward me. Get this now. He says, is taught by the precept of men. Amen. See, they don't have the learning of the fear of the Lord from the word of the Lord. The fear of the Lord that they have is taught by the precept of men, the tradition of of the elders. They teach for doctrines the commandments of men. They take man's word and they exalt it to be on par with God's word and say what we say is equivalent to what God has said and as a matter of fact it actually trumps that so that you ought to listen to us and not God. Now they honor me with their lips. They'll profess the Lord. They got that outward show but their hearts far from me. Far from me. They love their righteousness. Not the righteousness of God. Verse 14, he says, Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. He says, For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. See, they, they profess wisdom, don't they? He's going to bring it to naught. Verse 15, woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord. And their works are in the dark. And they say, who seeth us and who knoweth us? Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. That's what they do in their religious vanity. They just turn everything upside down. It's inside out and backwards. It's so manhandled and mangled to where you take the commandment of what God said and they twist it and contrive it and lay their traditions and their precepts upon it to the point that what comes out on the other end and what's taught by it actually produces the very opposite of the thing Amen. that God commanded. The design of it has a show of righteousness, but the goal of it is actually the transgression of the commandments of God. Amen. It's perverted and it's corrupt. And that's the way the religious leaders taught. They teach their system of traditional righteousness as a standard of perfection. Rather than going to the law and to the testimony as Isaiah charges them in another place. So what they're up against, what they're facing. Teaching the precepts of men rather than the commandments of God. And not only was Isaiah uh, prophesying this in relation to what was going on in his own day. And where the program stood when he was prophesying, when he was alive on this earth and, and uttering these prophecies... But what he's talking about here is actually a prophecy about those religious leaders that would exist over here when the Lord Jesus Christ was in the land and who he would contend with. We know that because in Matthew 15, the Lord himself will point back to this very prophecy when talking to the Pharisees and tell them that Isaiah was prophesying about them when he said that. Matthew 15, let's look at this. Matthew 15, we'll pick it up from the beginning of the chapter here in verse 1. He says, Then came Jesus, uh, to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? 
For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. All right, that's what God's commandment said. That's what God had commanded. Verse 5, he says, But ye say. God said one thing. You're saying something else. You've turned things upside down from the way God said it. He said, But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift. By whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. You see, the tradition looks righteous. It looks noble on the outward appearance. But the goal of the tradition was actually to transgress God's commands. And do right the opposite. He says, ye hypocrites. Ye hypocrites. He's not... Holding back on him, is he? Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but... That which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth the man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? And the Lord knew that. <laughs> they needed to be offended. That was the intent of it. Verse 13, he said, But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. They stagger, but not with wine. They stumble, but not with strong drink. The vision of all is under them as a book that's sealed. They're blind. They don't see it. There's no light in them. They don't have the truth. And those that follow their doctrine and their teaching are blind to it because of the blindness of their hearts and their minds, and they're following blind leaders. And he says, if you continue on following their doctrine, both end up in the ditch. It leads to destruction. Let them alone. You've got to break away from that. Time to get out. Blind leaders of the blind. And he says to them, well did Isaiah prophesy of you. You Pharisees that he's... Standing in front of right there, Isaiah prophesied of you. And not just that he prophesied of you, but well did he prophesy. He nailed the issue, you know, right between the eyes, so to speak. Exactly what's in your hearts, you hypocrites. Amen. Honor me with your lips, but your heart's far from me. Corrupt and vain system, transgressing the commandments of God by their traditions and by their precepts. Had that blinding effect so that the people could not see the truth that was right in front of their face. Right. right? Preaching the gospel of the kingdom, fulfilling prophecy after prophecy, performing the signs. It's so obvious when you know the prophets, what's going on as we've been able to see, and the people can't see it. Spirit of deep sleep's been poured upon them. Can't perceive. They can't see. They can't discern. They're following their blind leaders, and it's just contributing all the more to it. That's what they're facing. They turn things up all completely upside down. There's a passage back in Isaiah chapter 5 where the Lord through the prophet will say that they call evil good and they call good evil. Right the opposite of what God said. They put darkness for light, light for darkness. They put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Just turn it all upside down. Amen. Inside out, backwards, confused as you can be. Walking along thinking you're doing God's service when you're going in right the opposite direction. Serving the adversary's purpose. That's what, you know, that's, that's the corrupt and abominable doctrine that holds Israel at this time. That's what they've been taught to think. After the manner of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders and so forth. And the Lord, along with the prophets, has a whole lot more to say about that corrupt system and the vanity of it all as he's teaching his disciples and he's beginning to address that there in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He deals with different categories of their corrupt and false teaching. And he has to strip it of all their corruption and tell them what the truth is. So they can think about it properly. He ain't making friends. Uh, he's not making friends at all. 
And so it was needful that the Lord address this with his disciples here. Ones that are professing to be his followers. Looking for the kingdom. It was necessary for him to address this and to give them the capacity to be able to see that religious system for what it is. Again, that axe head's going through the nation. The separation's coming. He had announced it. And it's just one of the things here in the Sermon on the Mount is the Lord is beginning as that axe head. You know, the separation, when you hit with the axe, the, the end of that, the edge of it's narrow. But as the axe head passes through the tree, it gets wider and wider. Like the fatter it gets further back. And as it's passing through, the division gets wider and wider until finally there's just a complete separation. Amen. Sermon on the Mount is starting to force that axe head through there, make the division that much wider. But it's an abominable system. Look with me now at Psalms 50. The 50th Psalm. We see the corruption of the system. But here we've got a psalm that I think shows us how that the Lord giving his corrective doctrine in Israel was also a prophesied issue to address that. And how that he wasn't going to just allow that to go on unchecked. But the Lord himself would confront it. Which, of course, he does in the Sermon on the Mount. 50th Psalm here, the first 15 verses or so, you'll see that uh, the psalmist here is prophesying concerning the deliverances that come to the believing element of the nation that is provided for them by the mighty God. Those that follow him and fear him will be those that experience the deliverances in the time of trouble. And he talked about that in the, believer, uh, the believing element of the nation, about the first 15 verses, and then in chapter uh, 50 verse 16, he'll shift his attention to the apostate and unbelieving element in the nation. You can kind of see that transition as we read verses. Uh, we'll start with verse 15, see the end of the, the section to the believers. He says, And call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. All right? Those that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right? That's the believing element. They get the deliverances. Verse 16, he says, But... Right? Contrast to the deliverance that the believers get. He says, but unto the wicked God saith. Different class in Israel he's speaking to now. He says, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes and that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? Seeing thou hatest instruction and castest my words behind thee. That's what those wicked and vain religious leaders do, isn't it? They stand up and they presume to take his covenant and his word in his mouth. And they stand up as masters over the people to teach them. And he says, what do you have to do to stand up and have my words in your mouth? Seeing you hate the instruction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what you actually do, you hate it so much that you take my words and you put it back here behind you so you don't even have to look at it. Wow. All you want is your righteousness and your tradition and your religious system. Yeah. To cast the words of God behind you. Who are you to stand up and profess that you're speaking my word? He says in verse 18, When thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers. That's really what they are in heart, isn't it? Thieves. Yeah. When the Lord goes in the, the, the temple there and he cleanses the temple, doesn't he say that my father's house to be a house of prayer, but you've made it what? A den of thieves. Thieving. Thou shalt not steal. You ever heard of that? But they've got a tradition. They've got a system where they can, they can make that where that appears righteous. They can be thieving and lying as they can be and make it look righteous. You see a thief, you consent with him. Partakers, uh, you're partakers with adulterers. Repeatedly the Lord will say it's a wicked and adulterous generation. That's what they are. That's their heart. Verse 19, thou givest, uh, givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. They got a, a tongue that's set on fire of hell, you might say. Mm -hmm. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother, thou slanderest thine own mother's son. The Lord will deal with that one, that category of corruptive doctrine in the Sermon on the Mount itself. He says, these things hast thou done... And I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself. You think about the context of the program. What had God been doing for 400, 430 years at this point? 
What preceded the Gospels was a period of silence, wasn't it? He left them the law and the prophets, and then God had gone silent. And through that period of silence, what you've got is this vanity of the tradition of the elders that's beginning to form and to grow. And they consent with the thief, and they partake with adulterers, and their mouth frames deceit, and they teach error and falsehood among the people. And through that time, nothing happens. God's silent. Yes. No prophets to rebuke them. No prophets to come along and correct them and to call them out for their corruption and their sin and to expose them with the light. They're in their darkness thinking they're going to hide their works from the Lord as we read a moment ago. And God's silent to them. And because he's silent, they misinterpret the silence. They think the silence means something other than what it actually meant. Yep, They think that thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself. Because God was silent to them when all this was going on, they developed the idea that we're good with God. Our natural righteousness as the children of Abraham, be not children of fornication. Our righteousness is on par with the very righteousness of God. We're naturally righteous and holy. We're just like God. Thought I was just one or one such one as thyself. Our righteousness is acceptable to God. No wonder they were appalled when John the Baptist comes along and talks about who shall uh, warn you to flee from the wrath to come. Wrath? Against us? We've got righteousness that's on par with God. What do you mean wrath against us? It's where their heart's at. And that's what they think. But look at the end of verse 21 there. He says, but I, the Lord, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. When Messiah comes, and this is a, really a good verse on who Jesus Christ is, right? He's Jehovah in human flesh. That's Jehovah standing there in their midst. He says, I'm going to reprove thee. Yeah. He shows up there and what's he do in the Sermon on the Mount? He reproves them. And he'll do it to their face on a number of occasions. He reproves them. And we saw it in Matthew 15 there. They're bringing up the transgression of the, of the tradition of the elders. He said, you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition, you hypocrites. Calls them on the floor for it. Exposes it for the vanity that he is. And he says, I'll set them in order before thine eyes. I'll take those words that you cast behind your back and I'm going to set them in order. I'm going to strip it of all your vanity and corruption and sin. And I'm going to set it forth as the light that it is so that the people can understand it for the truth that it is. Set them in order before their eyes. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is doing. Amen. Reproving the vain religious system and setting the law and the prophets of the doctrine of them correctly in front of the eyes of the people so that they can perceive it and understand it and know where they're at in the program. He does that. And he gives them the warning, now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. They're headed for the ditch. They're not getting the deliverance, they're getting the destruction. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. Keep his commandments. It's physical salvation and rewarding that kingdom associated with that for the believers. Those wicked ones are going to be destroyed when they don't take heed. That's what he's talking about. Look at uh, Isaiah 42, if you will. Isaiah 42. We've got another prophetic passage here that prophesies that the Lord will give his corrective teaching. And Isaiah 42, verse 18 is where we'll pick it up. Here he's contrasting the faithful servant who is the Messiah. As he said in verse 1, Behold my servant. Contrasting that with the unfaithful servant of Israel who had transgressed. In verse 18, he says, Hear ye deaf, and look ye blind, that ye may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf is my messenger that I sent? Who is blind is he that is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant? Seeing many things, but thou observest not. Opening the ears, but he heareth not. He says, the Lord is well pleased for his righteousness' sake. His righteousness, not theirs. His righteousness' sake. What's he going to do? He says, he will magnify the law and make it honorable. 
That's right the opposite of what the vain religious system did. They didn't magnify the law. They minimized the law. They covered it over with their tradition. When the Lord comes, He's going to strip all that away. And instead of minimizing the law, He's going to magnify it. He's going to make it so that it does have effect when the people hear it. He makes it honorable when they hear it because it has the effect it's supposed to have. It's part of what He's doing in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. Prophesied issues. Stripping the law of its dishonor and magnifying its righteousness and truth. And then Isaiah chapter 8. Made reference to this verse last week. Part of what he does in the Sermon on the Mount as well. And magnifying the law. Setting it in order before their eyes. If you back up it to uh, verse... 13, you'll see also it's set in the context of the stone doctrine or the rock doctrine that we've been talking about as well. Isaiah eight thirteen, sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary and for a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Verse 16 is the key. He says, bind up the testimony and seal the law. Among my disciples. It's part of what he's doing. Sermon on the Mount, right? He's got his disciples up there. He's teaching them his doctrine. He's stripping it of the vanity, magnifying the law. And he's going to seal up that book and he's going to deliver it over to his disciples. To carry on with the ministry, right? The light's not with the religious leaders. To them, the book is as one that's sealed, and that's because the truth is sealed up among his disciples. Those are the ones that are going to have his truth and his testimony with them. That's where the light's going to be in Israel. And that's part of what he's getting underway there with the Sermon on the Mount and the corrective doctrine. Giving them the light there with his disciples so that they can perceive and see and understand the vanity of the religious system. And what the truth of righteousness and of God's all about as contained in the law. More that could be said about that, but all of that is really, it's, it's coalescing really around the doctrine of Christ, the rock of Israel. He's the chosen stone. We've seen him as the tribe stone. But now in the Sermon on the Mount in particular, we're going to see him start to lay down a foundation stone. His word, made honorable, magnified. Concerning him and his work. And he's given that over to his disciples. To have a sure foundation. As they proceed forward toward that kingdom. Challenging the vain religious system. And what he's going to do. And we'll see in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. As he just goes through the categories of corrupted doctrine. That that vain system taught. And he just counters it. Over and over and over and over again. You've heard it said. But I say unto you. You've heard it said. But I say unto you. He's teaching the truth. Showing them the truth. They're astonished at his doctrine. Separation's coming in Israel, folks. Mm -hmm. And he's making sure of that. And it's coming by the word of God. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. I hope that's been helpful for you. We'll try to look at some of these scriptures. We'll pick it up there next time. Carry it forward. Amen? Amen. Appreciate you. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we are thankful for the truth of your word. And we're grateful for the lessons that we can see and that we can learn from these scriptures of time past and so many applicable principles and truths that hold true even today in the face of vain religious systems that are of this world and of the adversary. Or we know that this world system is completely opposed to your truth, regardless of whether we're talking about your program with Israel when that was in effect or today what's going on with the body of Christ and the revelation of the mystery. And I pray that you'd help us to see these things and learn from these things that the whole religious system is devoted to destruction. It's wicked and there's no light in it. And may we learn in that to seek truth from you and from your word, the sole source that we can have a sure foundation on as we stand upon it. May we believe it with all our hearts and may you strengthen us in it, we pray. We give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen.